Hello, here I am again in the name of the Sovereign Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are continuing with my exposition of my translation of the book of Acts, using the Greek text of the Family 35. We are in chapter 7. I will now read from verse, verses 9 through 16. Stephen is giving his defense, and he just, just got started. So from here on, it's all Stephen talking, as it were. The patriarchs, being envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. Yet God was with him and delivered him out of all his adversities and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. And a famine came upon all the land of Egypt and Canaan, even a great affliction, and our fathers could not find food. But upon hearing that there was wheat in Egypt, Jacob first sent our fathers. On the second trip, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was presented to Pharaoh. Joseph sent and summoned his father Jacob and all his relatives, seventy-five souls. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were transferred to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor of Shechem. The first thing I wish to comment upon here is what is in verse 14. The rest is straightforward. We are all familiar with the, with the story. It here says at the end of verse 14, 75 souls. Now, if you compare this verse with Genesis 46, verses 26 and 27, we get three numbers, 66, 70, and 75. Some people have argued that this is a contradiction, not at all. All you have to do is pay attention to what the text actually says. The 66 said they are being out of his loins. Obviously, that it excludes Jacob himself. <laughs> All the wives, none of the wives, were from Jacob's loins. And Joseph was already down in Egypt. So what you have is the 11 sons and their children. And they come to exactly 66. The 70 includes Jacob, Joseph, and his two sons. But that's all. Just so... You have Jacob, Joseph, and two sons. You add four to 66, that gives you 70. No problem. So what about the 75? The 75 here excludes Jacob and Joseph, but includes nine wives. That's Jacob and Joseph and Joseph's two boys. So you take away four. Four plus five is nine. That would include nine wives, so I understand. That's my, that's my judgment on it, anyway. Probably some of the wives had already died in Canaan. For further discussion, please see the appendix, How Many? Acts 7.14 against Genesis 46.26 and Genesis 46.27. That's the appendix in my New Testament here. The Sovereign Creator has spoken. Or you can find it uh, free of charge on my site, French Org. Going on here then, we have another seeming difficulty exactly in verse 16. I'll read 16 again. They were transferred to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor of Shechem. The difficulty is that the only record we have of someone buying from Hamor is Jacob. That's in Genesis chapter 33 and verse 19. <laughs> Abraham bought from Ephron. That's in Genesis 23, 17. Shechem and Hebron are presumably quite different places. Assuming that Stephen's statement is correct, and if he was full of the Holy Spirit as he spoke, you see that in verse 55, then presumably Abraham actually bought both places, although Moses only records one. And Jacob was obliged to rebuy one or perhaps buy a larger area around it. A variety of historical records existed 
made during Old Testament times that were not included in the canon, and of which we don't have any copies. But they were still available in Stephen's day. For instance, the letter of Jude, verse 14, cites the prophecy of Enoch. Now, we have no Hebrew copy of Enoch's prophecy today. The last one we know of was in the 13th century. But obviously, Jude had access to one. In any case, notice that the text says they were taken to Shechem. This would refer to Jacob's sons, since Jacob himself had been buried at Hebron. You recall that when Jacob died, immediately he was taken up and buried. So the the, bury, the sons, including Joseph himself, what they were, their remains were taken when the people left Israel during the Exodus. And when they got to the land, then they, they buried them in Shechem. You wonder why that happened? Well, just remember what the text says. Going back to Genesis 34, verse 26, sorry, verse 29, after killing all the men of Shechem, Jacob's sons kept the women. Go back and read it. It's right there. Which is presumably where they got wives for so many men. They also got rich on the spoils of the town. So why not be buried there? So for further discussion, please see the appendix, who bought what from whom. Again, it's the same appendix. But let's stop and think about it a minute. Do you remember when Lot was taken captive and Abraham set off to rescue him? As I recall, I haven't checked it, but there were over 300, Abraham had, had 317 or 327, over 300 men that were armed and ready to fight. Well, if you have 300 and some men, then you also have that many women and who knows how many children. In other words, Abraham <laughs> had a, a whole small town with him. The number of people that were with Abraham would be around close to a thousand people. Well, it just so happens that uh, people keep on dying and people keep on being born and so on and such. So that very probably when Abraham got to Shechem, he probably had people dying, someone he had to bury. So he had to buy some property to bury his dead. And the same would happen for Jacob later on. So I deny that there's any problem here, though some people have tried to make a problem out of it. I take it that with total certainty, Abraham did in fact buy something there, only Moses did not record it in the book of Genesis. Going on now, let's read verses 17 through 29. Well, we have a longer paragraph this time. This is about Moses. Now, as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people increased and were multiplied in Egypt until a different king arose who had not known Joseph. This man took advantage of our race and oppressed our fathers, making them expose their babies so that they would not stay alive. At that time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. He was nurtured in his father's house for three months. When he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him to herself and brought him up as her own son. So Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the sons of Israel. Well, seeing one of them being wronged, he defended and avenged the one being oppressed, striking down the Egyptian. Now, he supposed that his brothers understood that God was giving them deliverance by his hand, but they did not understand. The next day he appeared to them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong one another? But the one who was wronging his neighbor pushed Moses away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Well, Moses fled at that word and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begot two sons. Verse 18 
says a different king, and the word for different here in the in Greek is a different kind. So that it was either a different dynasty or perhaps even a different race. Which is why, of course, that king would not know anything about Joseph or might prefer not to know anything about him. Now, at the end of verse 19, I my translation was sort of roundabout, making them expose their babies so that they would not stay alive. That's rather a strange way, but that's exactly the way it is in the Greek text. <laughs> The Greek text is around about, and I try to preserve that little deal. Uh, doesn't make much difference, but that's how come I, that's why I did that. Uh, they had to expose their babies so that they would not stay alive, or they weren't. They were not themselves obliged to kill the baby directly, but they had to. Get, what happened to Moses? They put him out in a little whatever reed boat. To see what would happen, and of course, if no one ever, if it had no one had taken care of him, he would have died. Anyway, when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him, adopted him. When he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the sons of Israel. If you would compare Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 24 through 26, it appears that Moses had formally refused the status of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter with the political and other advantages pertaining to that status. Now, really, such an attitude probably did not sit well with Pharaoh, which is why he prepared to kill Moses when the opportunity presented itself. You'll find that in the Genesis account, which is why Moses took off running. So we come to verse 25, and I confess that I don't understand this very well. It says here, he supposed that his brothers understood that God was giving them deliverance by his hand. But now really, as far as I can tell, this evaluation of Moses' thinking is not in the Old Testament, well, at least not at this juncture. Did Moses really suppose that killing an Egyptian would make a difference? Or that God would give deliverance in that way? <laughs> when we see him in heaven, we can ask him if you still want to know. But comparing this with verse 23, that's right above, we may conclude that it was God who put the idea of visiting his people in his heart. They did not understand. Well, they didn't have any reason to understand, actually, as far as I can see. So, we come now, the next thing I want to talk about is in verse 29. The rest is straightforward. Nothing to comment about, really. But why does Stephen mention Moses' two sons? <laughs> I confess that I find Stephen's selection of details to be curious. Look, Moses' two sons were not prominent in the history of Israel, so why mention them? Well, Moses' failure to circumcise them almost cost him his life. You can see that in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. Although Moses himself was certainly circumcised as a baby, he was brought up as an Egyptian, and the importance of the procedure had not been ingrained in him. His wife was not an Israelite and was against it. You can see that in the Genesis account. The, the wife was definitely not happy. But how could Moses lead the covenant people while ignoring the sign of the covenant? That wasn't going to work. It seems like uh, <laughs> Moses' sons enter into the sacred account only because of that little detail. You never hear about them again. So why did Stephen mention it? I, I, I judge that what he is doing, he's showing that all down through history, if the people of Israel, the people of the promise, if they obeyed God at all, they did so in an incomplete fashion. It began with Abraham. Abraham was incomplete in his obedience. God told him to leave every all his parents behind. No, 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 no. He took, he took his father and apparently uh, his 
Brother Heron, and along went the lot. So 15 years lost in Heron. The father dies. So then Abraham, moved. he should have left Lot behind. He did not leave Lot behind. Had Lot stayed in Haran, we would not have the Ammonites and the Amorites. And those were bad news then, and who knows, we don't know if anyone's still alive, but if they're still alive, they're not good news yet. If Lot had stayed in Haran, that would not have happened. So, at every point now, here we have Moses, Moses, the great Moses. He is going to be the great leader, but he has not fully obeyed God himself. So how is, so that's, I take it, that's the point of, of Stephen mentioning even these two sons. So now let's read verses 30 through 36. And when another 40 years had passed, angel of the Lord appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in the flame of fire in a bush. Well, upon seeing it, Moses was amazed at the sight. But as he approached for a closer look, the voice of the Lord came to him. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses started trembling. He did not dare to look. So the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have definitely seen the mistreatment of my people in Egypt and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. So now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? God sent him as leader and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. In verse 30, there is no article with angel. So I read angel of the Lord, that's angel of Jehovah, without the article. If you compare this with Exodus chapter 3, verse 2 and verse 4, it is clear that the angel of the Lord was Jehovah himself. Uh, that comes through right here in verse 31. The voice of Jehovah came to him. So that I understand that the angel of the Lord or Jehovah in the Old Testament was always Jehovah the Son. It was clearly Jehovah, and I understand it was always Jehovah the Son. It was the Son that was the main agent in the creation of this planet and our, our race, and I take it it was throughout all the human history, it was the son that was dealing most directly with us, as he would then be our savior and so on. Notice, please, again, that it says here in verse 30, it's in, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. Well, unfortunately, we have had a whole lot of false information <laughs> about Sinai. I don't know if you can see this no, this lovely little map that I that I copied off of Google Maps, but maybe you can see it. Uh, here we have the two ears, right, of the of the Red Sea. This is the the Suez, and this is Aqaba. Right here is the so so what uh, people call the <laughs> Mount Sinai, where you have the the uh, monastery of Saint Catherine. And there is a little mountain there, and someone has burned the top of it very, very kindly. <laughs> but if you read the text with care, it's quite obvious that this could not be it, because they had a they had a forced march of three days and three nights. That's why that's why they had the pillar of fire by night, so they could see the pillar of fire. Look, if you're trying to sleep, you do not want a pillar of fire. Okay, you want it to be dark. So if you have a pillar of fire, it's for you to see. And the text is quite clear. They were going three days and nights. As a matter of fact, the, the land of Goshen is just right up here. They came right across here and came here to Ezion Geber, which is now called Eilat. The, 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 the true uh, Mount Sinai is right about here on this side. The text is very clear. They were forced to turn aside and go into the desert. They came down here to, uh, actually to uh, a very large 
beach. It's a, it's a monstrous beach called uh, uh, Nueva. It would hold, it's the only place anywhere around that would hold several million people, and it would. But the text says that when they went, they left the route and went into the desert, Pharaoh said, aha, they have lost their way and they are lost in the desert. And so then he took off with his mounted troops, the chariots. Now look, it says, Pharaoh said, hey, they lost their, look, if they were on this side of the Suez, as people like to say, there's no way they could get lost here. They had been here for hundreds of years. They had probably hunted all through this area. They knew this place like the palm of their hand. There's no way they're going to get lost here. Not only that, if they were down along here, there was no need for, for Pharaoh to send his chariots. He could just send his foot soldiers. His foot soldiers could go much faster than they could go with all their animals and the women and children. And they could just, quite obviously, as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, this gulf here is very deep. It's, I think it's over over 100 yards deep. It's very deep. But right here at Nueva, there is a land bridge right across, just a few feet under the surface, and it's several hundred yards wide. It's a causeway, which is just exactly right for the people to go over. So anyway, Mount Sinai is in or Mount Horeb, is in Arabia. It is not in what people nowadays call the Mount Sinai Peninsula. Just, I have, a, I have an article on that as well. But I make a point of that simply because if you compare, if you look at, if you, if you accept what they say about this and you compare it with exactly what the biblical text says, it makes the biblical text nonsense. The, the biblical text is stupid. If this is where Mount Sinai is, if it was this arm that they crossed somehow, it makes the account stupid, and I don't really consider that the Bible is stupid. Well, okay, that's my little my little blurb for today. <laughs> Notice that when God introduces himself here in verse 32, the Lord Jesus used this later on. Uh, to prove the resurrection to the Sadducees. You may, you'll remember that, maybe. That's in Matthew 22, 32. But the actual account is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, where God said this to Moses. Notice that verse 34, God says, I have come down to deliver them. Come down from where? Well, I, I assume from heaven, obviously. And I would say that whenever the text says that God comes down, or whenever he comes down, whether the text says it or not, <laughs> it is to intervene in human affairs. He's going to come down and uh, intervene sovereignly, make a sovereign difference with what's going on down here. That's what happened here. God came down, he came down in person. It was God himself that was talking to Moses there. He was there in person. He said, now I'm going to send you to Egypt. Now we start to get close to <laughs> the point of Stephen's speech. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a defense. He knew good and well it was a kangaroo court. It was all a farce. He didn't try. He was simply uh, giving a prophetic and condemnatory message, if you like. Those guys who said, who made you a ruler and a judge? God sent that same person back as leader and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man, Moses, led them out, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. 